All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our presentation today. It's called Cleaning House. And we have quite a few people registered on Zoom, uh, most of whom are me uh, mental health professionals. We're also broadcasting live on Facebook. Um, and so this uh, recording, in case you can't catch it all or you want to share it with someone afterwards or watch it later, you will be able to find it on Facebook. And to everyone who's registered right now, uh, you will be receiving an email with a link to the presentation and a PowerPoint um, and also some handouts and, of course, ways to reach our presenters. So many of you have attended our presentations before. My name is Jackie Harunian. I'm the new managing partner of Whistleman Harunian Family Law. We're in Carl Place. And uh, this is a topic uh, that I think is really relevant for almost everyone especially at the beginning of the year, where I think we want to have good intentions of having um, good decisions and making uh, New Year's resolu resolutions. But this year, I think, is a little bit different. I think all of us want to be a little bit kindler and gentler to ourselves. And so uh, I, uh, along with Carolyn and Aviva, came up with a presentation that I think is going to be highly relevant to everyone, not even uh, family law related. It's really how to just uh, clean up and clear up our lives in various ways. And so uh, it's my pleasure to start by um, introducing all of you to our, uh, our presenters. Um, but actually, before I do that, I'm going to start with the house, housekeeping matters for this presentation, um, because I know some of you have joined a little bit late. So this is the topic of our presentation. 2022 is here. Uh, forget about New Year's resolutions. This is a year for self-care, simplicity, and smart cleanup decisions that will bring us all peace of mind, and all of us can use peace of mind. And we're going to have three specific topics that we're focusing on. First, regarding making good decisions with money, and that's going to be presented by Aviva Pinto, and you're going to hear her background in a moment. Uh, the second, second topic is how to make good decisions regarding your home and your personal space. Maybe you're moving, maybe you're re relocating, or maybe you're buying a house or selling a house like everyone seems to be during this pandemic, or you just want to have a little bit more space in your life. And finally, at the end, I'll be presenting regarding some family law topics and how to create boundaries to have better, safer, healthier relationships. Uh, and making family law decisions if you need to. So we're going to save the, the more dramatic elements for the end of this presentation. Um, we love to have questions and answers. You can easily submit your questions and answers in the chat um, or in the Q&A. Uh, and if you really feel like you want to get in touch with one of the presenters and ask questions more privately, of course, you can do that. And I'm going to share our contact information. So as I mentioned, we're gonna be sharing the PowerPoint. We're gonna be emailing it to everyone who's registered. If you're watching on Facebook right now, you can easily message or make a comment. I'm happy to email it to anyone. Um, and you can also submit questions on Facebook. Uh, I'll take a look and see if there's any questions there. I wanna point out that for anyone who's seeking credits, CEUs, CEUs uh, as a social worker or mental health professional, we do have a process to provide free credits. Our office has always provided uh, free credits um, when we do virtual presentations, and this is our licensing information. We're accredited um, through the next several months and we'll be renewing our certification for that, so don't worry about that. Um, and these are the dates that you need to keep in mind in case you want credits. We'll be sending you the evaluation forms and in a week or two, you'll have uh, the certificates. I also am putting out here that if you're enjoying these presentations and if you're so inclined, I would love if you could leave us a review on Google uh, so that we can continue to bring you these presentations um, at no charge. So uh, this is a, something that I saw that I thought was really relevant and um, it's really about creating boundaries and it takes that first step to make a good decision, uh, whether it's your money or your home or personal space or your relationships. And um, this is a little bit of a joke. Obviously, a fence that is open on all sides isn't much of a boundary, but it does take steps. 
And uh, we're going to hopefully teach you today how to set some boundaries or make some goals that will help you. Um, and we have some top, top five lists too that you can screenshot and save. So um, actually, before I get to Jessica, I'm going to stop the share so I can introduce our, our presenters today. Our first presenter is Aviva Pintos, who you see here. She's the managing director. She's a managing director at Wealthspire Advisors in New York City and Long Island. She has over 25 years of experience in the financial services industry. She works with individuals in transition, which is something that Carolyn and I do as well. Uh, sale of a business, inheritance, divorce, uh, death of a spouse. Uh, and she helps people determine the most appropriate course of action for their financial assets. She helps guide them so they feel more confident about their financial future. She did her undergrad at University of Michigan. She's passionate about University of Michigan. <laughs> and she did her MBA at University of Chicago Business School. She is a certified divorce financial analyst and a certified divorce specialist. Welcome, Aviva, and thank you for participating today. Thank you for our next, me. Yes, we can't wait to hear what you're going to say. Our next presenter is Carolyn Dow. So Carolyn has a very, very interesting job. And then when I first met her, uh, I was so struck by how important her services are and how many connections she has with so many people that can be helpful if you're in transition. She's responsible for business development with Seriatum Inc., which is a New York City-based leader in professional organizing and moves for over two decades. After owning a successful catering company for 25 years, she brings her warmth and people skills to help clients with major milestones, many of them who are in transition in the ways that Aviva helps, uh, inheritance, uh, an estate uh, issue, a divorce, having to clear out a house. And um, she, she grew up abroad. She's very sensitive to people of diverse cultures and backgrounds and she uh, is quick to develop trust and put them at ease. Carolyn and Sari Adam bring harmony and order to life transitions. My God, I love that. We all need that. We all need that. Carolyn, can't wait to hear what you have to say. Yeah. So welcome to the 70 plus people that are joining us on Zoom. Uh, in case you missed it, we will be sharing a PowerPoint and this presentation will be available later on um, on Facebook. Uh, thank you, Omid Zara, my friend who just uh, gave us some, some words of encouragement. Thank you, Omid. So now a quick introduction about myself. As I mentioned, I'm an attorney. I'm a mediator. Uh, we have a practice on Long Island. It's called Whistleman Harunian Family Law. And I'll be presenting on topics related to family law, financial control, and domestic violence issues. I uh, always want to bring awareness about that. And a lot of things that sort of uh, support the things you're going to hear from Carolyn and Aviva that might be relevant in a family law context. So you'll be hearing from me. Um, I've been practicing family law for over 25 years. I actually started out as a law student in this same firm where I'm practicing now. I'm very proud to say that we have one of the largest family law teams in the New York area. And I've always been very interested in the mental health component of family law matters. Um, because people that come to our firm are usually in family crisis. Uh, and, and the psychological and emotional aspects of that are really what we deal with at the very beginning. Then it kind of morphs into financial and legal negotiations. And then hopefully at, at the ends when people can move on with their lives with a positive mindset. So everything we're talking today, of talking about today is really relevant to uh, transition whether you're single, married, or divorced, how can you make better decisions? Especially this year, when I think so many of us are just overwhelmed and exhausted by the lives we are living. Um, I'm just going to quickly put up this, um, this graphic that I really liked. I think we're all feeling this right now, right? <laughs> okay. So now, uh, I'm now going to... Um, have Aviva take over. Aviva, I'll put up your PowerPoint or you want to? Um, no, I'll, I'll just talk first and then. Okay, I let me know the... when you want to put up the PowerPoint, okay? No problem. All right, wonderful. So here we have everyone, Aviva Pinto, who really is a um, top of her field when it comes to financial planning and specifically divorce financial planning. And she's my friend and colleague. Over to you, Aviva. 
Thank you, Jackie. It's a pleasure to be here. Happy New Year, everybody. Um, I want to start this by saying that there's no judgment here. We are all going to learn something, hopefully, today. Um, and finances are one of the most important things that you can bring uh, to your new year in starting out how to get better organized and, and getting things in order. So Jackie, this is a perfect topic for the beginning of the year. So uh, most people don't begin their marriages expecting it to end in divorce. Uh, and if you're going through one, the best thing you can do is remain well informed. And many people getting divorced may be smart, accomplished, well-established professionals, but may not be the one who handled the finances in their marriage. If this applies to you, it may be tempting to postpone financial concerns until after the divorce for the sake of your emotional well-being, but that would be a big mistake. There are a lot of people um, who find themselves like on the brink, if you will, you know, they want to jump under their covers of their beds and just pull the covers over them and say, I don't want to deal with them because they're not fully aware of what they have or what they'll obtain post-divorce or whether they can even afford to get divorced. This is a common issue. And the level of financial literacy should not be a source of embarrassment, nor should it prevent you from leaving an unhappy marriage. Um, Jackie, I, I think that we had talked about a case that um, we were going to talk about in this presentation. And I don't know if you wanted to go over that case before I continued or whether you wanted me to talk. Yes, about it. thank you very much, uh, Aviva, for reminding me. We did collaborate on creating a, uh, a, a case that we can all comment on. Um, and it's a case that might be very familiar and resonate with a lot of people listening because it really speaks to a universal experience in some ways and unique experiences in other ways. So the, the case we came up with is someone named Jessica. She is 55 years old an empty nester in an unhappy marriage. There is no physical violence, but she feels like she's being constantly put down and marginalized. Her husband, Matthew, might be having an affair, but she's not even sure that she really cares. She works full time, has a good income as a real estate broker, but she has credit card debt and very little in savings. Her father died five years ago and her mother recently passed away from COVID. So Jessica has taken a leave of absence from work to deal with her mother's estate, the house and the overflowing closets. Jessica's brother lives out of state and is no help. So that's the um, hypothetical client that we all came up with. Um, there are aspects that relate to life transition, dealing with parents, dealing with relationships, but most of all dealing with money and stuff. So yes, Aviva, over back to you. Okay, thank you. So, you know, using Jessica as an example, what do we know about her? Well, we know that she is contemplating divorce. So she has a husband that, you know, she's like not really that excited about the marriage. Um, but she she's also got an inheritance. Um, she's got one you know, it's a horrible situation. She's going through a lot. She has one parent who has already passed. She has another one who has just passed and now has a house that she has to decide what she's going to do with. Uh, so there are a lot of very interesting things that are going on in Jessica's life, and she's probably going to, you know, freak out a lot about it. So the first thing that she needs to do is look at you know, her mother just passed away. She has to get herself a trust and estate attorney if she doesn't already have one, and they need to probate the will. They are going to have to figure out who is the beneficiary of the assets. So when the father passed, it probably passed to the mother. And now that the mother is passed, it is probably going to pass to her and her brother or grandkids. So what has to happen, most important thing, is that they have to figure out who is getting what. Second thing is going to be 
how does she protect herself if she is going to go through this divorce? And that is keeping her assets separate. So there are a number of things, and I'll go through this, Jackie will probably speak about it also, but the most important thing if you decide to get divorced is arming yourself with information. And it's really a roadmap and checklist to help you get organized and help you feel better prepared to manage your personal finances as you navigate the difficult processes. So before getting the divorce, you have to remember that it can feel like a business transaction because the focus is primarily on money and the splitting of assets. Also has to do with custody, but in this case, we're just going to focus on the finances. So many people, especially if they didn't manage the finances, don't have a complete picture of aspects of their financial lives, such as their mortgages and their debts and their investments and their pensions, even their spending. When I ask people, how much do they spend every year? They don't really know. People don't keep track of their budgets. Um, and sometimes people didn't pay much attention and simply signed what was put in front of them like joint tax returns. So while every marriage has roles and division of responsibilities, if you weren't in charge of handling the finances yourself, you can find yourself at a disadvantage. Uh, but you don't have to do this alone. There are a lot of people that can help. Your matrimonial attorney, like Jackie, can sit down with you and show you what she's going to need to bring in front of a judge before the divorce starts. And what they're going to have to have you fill out is called a statement of net worth. And a statement of net worth just puts down every asset that you have, your house, your investment accounts, your jewelry, your artwork, anything at all of value. It also lists what you owe. So credit card debt and mortgages and your car payments, those are going to go down there. It's also going to list what you own yourself and what you own jointly. So if you came into the marriage with certain assets and never put them together with your husband's or spouse's uh, uh, assets, then those, if they've never been commingled, are your separate assets. The inheritance, like in Jessica's case, if Jessica takes this inheritance that she gets and she keeps, keeps it separate in her own name, then that will not be considered marital assets when they go to split up during the divorce. You can also meet with your CPA accountant and your wealth manager. And if you don't have a wealth manager, there are a lot of certified divorce financial analysts that can work with you and help you pull up all this information together. So the real reason that you want to start working with somebody before you get divorced is because you can be better prepared. So I assist many clients who come to me after their divorce saying they've never even read their divorce stipulation. And therefore, they're sometimes surprised by what they've agreed to. And some don't fully understand the hardships that will come as a result. Luckily, many mistakes can be avoided by getting financial advice before you start the negotiations with your attorney. And having your own financial advisor will make you feel more confident, protected during the legal process. So what I wanted to do is talk specifically about um, Jessica and also the documents that she's going to have to gather. So for her mother, there, she's going to have to figure out you know, who, where the bills have been coming in from, how to keep paying the bills. She's going to have to keep up this house until they can go with... Um, go and clear it out, which you'll hear about in a few minutes, and sell it. And in the meantime, she's going to have to make sure that the taxes are being paid, that the lights are staying on, that the heat is on. You know, we've got this, you know, 17 to 27 degree weather that we've been experiencing. So you want to make sure that, uh, you know, the pipes aren't going to freeze if you turn everything off. And so you are going to have to make sure that the bills are being paid. And you're also going to have to pull together information like bank statements 
and credit card statements and what has been going on. You call the accountant and find out what's been going on with the tax return. And so those, those pieces of information are going to help when you pull together what's going on with the estate. The same time, she's going to have to be pulling information together if she's working, her payroll statement, her property income, if they have an extra house and they're renting out as a and b or something like that, insurance coverage, the deeds and titles for real estate and vehicles. And the good reason for gathering everything over, over time is so that information doesn't quote unquote disappear. And although you have access to joint statements and documents while you're married, you may find that you may not have that um, once a divorce proceeding starts. So it's very important to do that. Um, those who aren't familiar with these documents or are not sure how to manage their own finances, it seems daunting and it is. Like I said, you know, start making a note of where they're located as soon as you can and then have somebody help you go through it. So filling out the statement of net worth, that is uh, to make that process easier during a difficult time. Um, you can work with a financial advisor, your matrimonial attorney, your accountant to fill it out. Uh, and, and they can really take you through it. And it doesn't have to be as daunting. It is 15 pages long, but it doesn't have to be as daunting. Um, and then you can take a look at how much debt you have. And the most important thing, especially for Jessica, if she's going through this divorce, is to see that everything is paid. She may want to take some of that money that she's inheriting from her mother and pay off all the debt that she has, because anything that's going to be, and, and pull everything into her own name, because everything that's going to be in the marriage is going to be divided equally. So that includes the debt, even if she didn't run up that debt herself. So it's very important, get rid of all that, change the title on things to make sure that it's in her name and not joint name. So credit cards going forward, just put in your name and not uh, not your spouse's joint name, and this way there won't be um, there won't be any questions about you know who owns that debt. Um, and then the other things that Jessica needs to think about in terms of um, her divorce and what and what's going to go through is she has to look at the marital property and see her house. Can she afford to stay in the house? Can she afford to buy out her husband from the house? Does she want to downsize and maybe move into her mother's house if it's a smaller house than the one that she's living in? So there are a lot of different things and scenarios that Jessica can, can go through to figure out what she should be doing. Um, the, the important thing is working with Jessica, I would do a financial plan. And what a financial plan does is it's a roadmap and it takes you from where you are today to where you're going. Now, women are living to be 94 years old on average. So if Jessica is say in her fifties and you know she's got another 40 some years to go and her money is going to have to last that long. What a financial plan does is it takes into account all of your assets. You know, if you're making an income, if you're on um, Social Security, if you've got a pension, if she's getting an inheritance, whatever that income is, it takes a look at inflation. Now, today, the number came out that inflation was 7% last year. On average, it ranges 2 to 3%. So anything that you are buying today is going to cost you 2% more or 3% more next year. And it keeps going from there. So it's very important to look at if I'm spending a dollar today, I am going to need more than a dollar next year to buy those same goods. So we look at inflation. Because women are living longer, you also have to look at healthcare. 
So healthcare is getting more and more expensive, and it's ranging 4.9% a year in inflation. So if you are buying a healthcare policy today, it's going to cost you almost 5% more next year, and so on and so forth. So buying a policy today, you have to think in terms of it's not just going to cost me what I'm buying today, it's going to be much more expensive going forward. And if Jessica has 40 more years to live, then you can see that she's going to need a lot of money just to pay for her health care. Because women are living longer, we're also going to need to look at things like disability and also long-term care. And there are a number of um, long-term care plans out there. You can also look and see whether you can self-fund um, your plan. But you're going to have to think in terms of if I'm going to live to 94, if I'm not healthy when I'm 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, where am I going to live? Who's going to be taking care of me? And how do I want that to look? So your financial plan will take into account those expenses. It will look at how you're currently invested. Where do you have your money? Is it in stocks? Is it in bonds? Is it a, is it a joint um, some of some of uh, of each. Uh, do you have an IRA? Do you have a 401k? Are those assets being maximized? Are you um, getting your your uh, tax exemption, if you will, by having it uh, accumulate tax free? And then it also looks at how the portfolio is doing. Should it be reallocated? Should you have more in stocks, more in bonds? Are you too conservative? Are you taking on too much risk? How much do you need to pull out from your portfolio every year? So the financial plan really gives you a roadmap of where you are today and how you're going to get to the end of your life. And I work with clients all the time putting together their financial plans. It's very important, especially in a divorcing um, situation to understand because if you're going through a divorce and you're the one that's going to be getting a settlement, then you are the one that's going to have to understand what that settlement can pay for. So, um, Jackie, if you would put up the things um, that five points that I want to leave everybody with. Thank you. Let me just move it to full screen. There we go. So number one, I want everybody to get organized, gather the documents so you have a complete picture of your financial life. Number two, fill out your statement of net worth. And like I said, you don't have to do it alone. You can work with somebody and you need to understand what is yours and what is your spouse's. Number three, create a budget. Because people don't understand always what they spend and what they're spending it on, creating a budget will show you maybe you're spending too much on clothing, maybe you're spending too much on Ubers, maybe you're spending too much on uh, ordering in. And then identify your priorities. If you want to keep that house, can you afford to keep it? I have clients that come to me, they have beautiful homes, their kids grew up in it, their kids wanna stay in the neighborhood to go to high school, whatever it is. You may not be able to afford that house. So we have to identify what's more important to you. Is it more important to keep the house and have less to spend? Or is it more important to maintain the lifestyle and maybe downsize a little bit? And then, as I said, creating a financial plan. Financial plan will know, will show you um, what to expect post divorce, where you are today, and where you're going. So, with that, I will uh, turn it back to Jackie. We can get questions anytime. Like I said, there's no there's no stupid question. There's only great solutions, and I'm happy to help anybody who uh, is going through anything that Jessica is going through. Thank you, Aviva. This is amazing. And I actually want to stay with your five top money tips and, and widen the lens a little bit uh, so that everyone can take in the fact that this doesn't only apply if you're going through a divorce. I mean, Jessica is not sure if she wants a divorce. It sounds like she hasn't even asked her husband whether he's having an affair. It sounds like she's a little overwhelmed, like so many people are, where there's too many things in her head. Her parents just passed away. She's dealing with COVID. She's a success, successful 
real estate agent. I mean, maybe she should turn her focus to her relationship and find out what's really going on there. But regardless of that, these five tips really apply to every single person. And I do see, we all see as financial professionals and dealing with organization with people in midlife or that have stuff that uh, people live in denial. They're afraid of talking about money in their relationships. They don't necessarily know what's going on financially. And uh, women in particular, unfortunately, I see a lot of them have never looked at their own tax returns don't really understand what their net worth is. And what I think is a very useful exercise for everyone listening uh, is that if you're a person, uh, even in your 20s or early 30s, you should know what your net worth is. You should know what your budget is. You should be familiar and comfortable with your financial documents because it's only by um, knowing what you have, knowing what you earn, knowing what you spend, that you will learn how to get comfortable with money, how to work with financial professionals like Aviva, um, and whether you end up divorced or widowed or single, um, that you will have a command of your financial life and have uh, what financial literacy is. Aviva mentioned that term. Financial literacy is, is the ABCs of money. That's not and that, something, yeah. Go and ahead. Jackie, the, the, you know, some of the things that people should realize, I mean, especially a lot of the people listening in here are um, therapists and social workers and the people who are dealing with the emotional side of what these clients are going through. Financial literacy is not taught in schools. It is not taught in families. People are not experts at all of these things. And so it's very, very emotionally driven, especially when it comes to money. People have these um, preconceived notions of what money is and what it does and what it should do. And there's a lot of guilt associated with it. There's a lot of fear associated with yeah, it. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of emotion. Exactly. A lot of it is also gender roles. You know, women uh, in, our, in our society are conditioned sometimes to take more of a back seat when it comes to managing money, which is why they don't always have good credit, which is why their names are not always on assets, including their own house. It doesn't have to be this way. And this is, again, separate from whether you're facing a separation or divorce. It really is taking ownership, sometimes having uncomfortable conversations. I call them courageous conversations with your partner or spouse. I want my name to be on the house. It's important to me that I meet with our accountants. I want to know what is going on with our investments. Again, in a healthy relationship, these questions shouldn't be an issue. And if there's a resistance to letting you have a seat at the table as a woman, as a decision maker, you know, you need to find out why there is resistance and, and hopefully work together and have a strong partnership that's based on both of you having your names on assets, being aware of going what's on with debt um, and having your own credit. So every woman listening, no matter what your age, you should have a copy of your credit report. You should know why your credit is good or bad and take steps to fix it. As Aviva said, you could be living into your 90s. That's a very common scenario now for women, uh, even women that are married or not married. So. You have to be a big girl. You have to get familiar with money, comfortable with money, and have those uncomfortable conversations, which could lead to making better financial decisions as a couple. And I've seen many marriages saved by sitting down, creating a budget, and having a joint plan. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the legal and divorce side when I get to my presentation, but it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, our next speaker, I've never really spoken at length with a financial organizer, someone who does organization for a living. It sounds so interesting. Um, and it sounds like you can really change lives and really help people in a very meaningful way. And so uh, Carolyn is gonna be our next speaker. Uh, it also uh, is interesting for me that you deal with, uh, in a divorce context, couples with high net worth. They have artwork. They have wine collections, they have jewelry, uh, they have maybe rugs or expensive antiques. And these are assets just like any other assets in a marriage. And from my vantage point, in the cases I've dealt with over the past 25 years, these are often assets that go missing. Suddenly the jewelry is gone. Uh, you know, the safe deposit box is emptied. 
or the wine collection, you know, no one knows where it is. I had a case where the wine collection, uh, one of the parties just drank it during the case. And there was nothing really that could be done to restrain it because the proper inventory uh, and appraisal hadn't been made. So these are important assets. These are things that, uh, you know, from an insurance standpoint, if you're married or not, you should probably have a record of what your assets are. Maybe, Carolyn, you could speak to ways to safeguard these assets in a more proactive way uh, for insurance purposes. Um, but from a divorce standpoint, I wish all of my clients had a good inventory of these types of assets. Uh, because it certainly would help, would certainly uh, maybe avoid the need to run to a judge and get restraining orders, which we can do. Uh, so it's very interesting to me, and I'm really looking forward to Carolyn learning from you. So what I'm going to do first, Carolyn, is put you up so that everyone can see you. And when you're ready and you want me to share the screen of your tips, I'm happy to do that. Just let me know. Um, and uh, let's not forget Jessica. Jessica lost both of her parents, has a house overflowing with her own parents' stuff. And um, Carolyn, uh, can't wait to hear what you have to say about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And Aviva, that was fantastic. My God, so many details. It, it really is overwhelming, but to see it uh, put it the way you put was really, really helpful. So yes, so my name is Carolyn Dow and I work with a company called Seriatum. We are professional organizers, inventory and move management specialists. And actually the company has been in business for almost three decades. I should really say that because that's the truth. That's when Sonia started. Um, so my background, as uh, Jackie had mentioned, is I've had a catering company in New York City for about 25 years, uh, enjoyed it, loved it, as a matter of fact. And then, of course, when 2020 came along, my events started being postponed, delayed, and then, of course, canceled completely. So, you know, you catch your breath, you organize your closets, and then I tried to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, and I realized that I had uh, met somebody over a year and a half before, and her name was Sonia, and she was a professional organizer. I really, really liked her. And I thought that the strengths that I had in catering, which is, you know, timeline and moving parts and, you know, projects and working in teams and uh, attention to detail, all those things would be, and being in and out of people's homes would be um, you know, helpful for me to go and work with an organizer. So she was actually my first call. and. Here I am, so I'm really, really happy about that. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Jessica's story and we're going to, and I'll talk about the divorce aspect of how we can help later on, uh, Jackie, because I definitely put that aside. So uh, Jackie, um, what she's, uh, excuse me, Jessica, what she's dealing with is something that a lot of people have dealt with. As a matter of fact, when I talk to people and tell them what I do, the first thing they'll say is, oh, I wish I knew you eight years ago or seven years ago when I dealt with my mother's home or, you know, my father's uh, space. And uh, that's kind of the work that we do. It's two thirds of what we do is uh, downsizing and estate clearing. And so the Jessica story is a very, very typical thing. So uh, we can go ahead and go with the PowerPoint actually, because I'm going to elaborate on each one. So thanks, Jackie. Okay, great. So yes, just like uh, Aviva said, you have to make a plan. Um, there is a timeline. Sometimes the home has to be sold by a certain amount of time, or is there going to be a broker that needs to show it right away? Or is this something that can just sit there? You know, we just uh, mentioned that we don't know for sure if Jessica is going to be selling the home because maybe it doesn't make sense for her to sell the home before a divorce proceedings if they're about to take place, take place. So, but regardless, there's still so much stuff. It's overwhelming. And she's dealing, of course, with the pain and the mourning of just losing her mother through COVID. And who knows what those final days were like if she was even able to see her. So her brother is out of town. And that's a very typical scenario as well. Sometimes the kids are not in the same space. And if they are or in the same town, their relationships are stressed. So it makes it difficult for us. So what we do is we come in and we want to create a plan. Is there a timeline? I always say, if you can bring somebody to help you, great. I'm one that will always ask for help. I don't shy from asking for help. And I, I, I endorse it all the way. So bring a friend with you just so that you can catch your breath with them. Uh, be kind to yourself. It's overwhelming. It'll stop and start. Um, but anyway, so the first thing 
is to create the plan. We have that. Gather all the papers and financial documents. So as we know, um, Aviva mentioned, there's so many of them that we know exist. So we kind of know what we're looking for. We know that we're looking for uh, financial statements, but then there's a lot of documents that as we're going through their paperwork and the paperwork could be in lots of bankers boxes or shopping bags behind you know, the, the back of closets, we will be uncovering things that we may not know exist. Is there an additional storage space somewhere that's holding things? Is there an additional property that people don't, don't know about? The will, all of those financial statements are things you have to go through. And of course, there's a lot of stuff. Um, I always remember actually the first job that I was at, because like I said, they end up in different places. Sometimes you can't expect to find them in a filing cabinet. They're not usually laid out like that, but mine are. But anyway, so um, I remember the first job I was at uh, was Sonia. She said, my job was basically to organize the books because there were so many books in this person's home. He was in an assisted living. And she said to me, shake out all the books. And I said, why? She says, because people put like papers and cash in the books. And I said, oh, really? So of course I'm diligently shaking out all the books. And wouldn't you know, I think it must be just beginner's luck, but there it was. I said, Sonia, look, and we found $4,000 in cash, which of course uh, the client was so happy to have discovered. He probably forgot that it was even there. So those are the, you know, the funny stories, the happy moments of going through people's things. Um, so yes, the financial documents, all of that. Uh, gal, uh, group items by like categories. And what I mean by that is when you're looking at the space, you know, try to, obviously you're not gonna be able to move all the furniture around, but certainly you can put together all the clothes in one area, all the jewelry in one area. If there's art, get a sense of the art that's all, all there. If there's silver, those are things that estate buyers are always interested in buying the silver. Um, memorabilia and photos, keep them all together. If you have tons and tons of vases, no point in having them in different places in the house, get them all so that they're in the same space. And you at least can get a sense of what is there because you know, like uh, Jackie said, Financial assets are one thing, and then there's all these tangible assets, and we're here, we're here to help manage all those things. Um, divide things into piles. These are areas where people, I think, struggle. So there's the keep, the not keep, and then the maybe. And we try to avoid as little maybe as possible because you can really spend a lot of time there. And maybes are, you know, involve memories and memorabilia and things like that. So let's just go with the to keep. So Jessica sees things in her mom's house. A lot of things are probably things that she and her brother had growing up, you know, when she graduated high school, college, whatever, who knows how many decades uh, the mother had this home. And so uh, those are things you want to keep clothes that fit her. Uh, items that she may want to have in the house if she's considering selling it. Maybe this is some kind of furniture or uh, design style that she may want to keep um, it, 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 in the house in case she doesn't sell it. Um, so there, that's an easier pile to keep. The not keep are things that uh, have value. So for example, there might be art. It's not necessarily Jessica or her brother's style, but it's a value. So now what we want to do is we want to appraise it and try to find out different um, places that would uh, bid for it. So whether it be auction houses or it can be estate buyers. So there's art. Uh, there could be clothing, you know, just because nobody's taking the clothing doesn't mean it can't be sent over to homeless shelters for women. If Jessica's mom was a particular size, maybe that's what they have a lot of need for. Uh, everything basically, we will try to find a way to either sell it, donate it, and find a home for it in some way, recycle it. Um, I always say that in New York City, if you have furniture, because everybody thinks their furniture was so wonderful when it was bought 20 years ago, and it was, and it still looks good, it's very hard to dispose of furniture. You have to find a home for it. You have to find a place to move it. And then of course you have to pay for the actual moving of it because donation sites are not picking up. And that certainly became stricter during COVID. Um, but so if you're in a building, I say, talk to the super, talk to the porter, see if anybody wants any of these things. They will make your life easier because they're going to actually take it for you. What's heartbreaking when I go to these different estates is the amount of pianos. Try giving away a piano. Oh my God, it's, it's unbelievable. So 
my lesson now is when I see something like that and, and, and somebody's in that home, I just say, tell all your friends, tell anybody in the building, please, here's a piano. Are you thinking of giving your kids music lessons? This is the perfect time to do it. So that's the thing with pianos. Um, another thing also when people want to donate is bring in your friends, order in some food, see if there's anything that they would want, that their kids would want, you know, a starter kitchen set of some sort that will make it that will make you feel better because you feel like the things that are here that meant so much to you at one point will have a life of their own and will be loved and appreciated. Um, so that's how I deal with all the, the donations, but there's different levels of donations. There's the you know, high end estate things. There's uh, junk luggers is a wonderful time to come in and they will take everything. We just dealt with uh, them in a place out in Queens. There was so much stuff. There were so many levels of vendors that we had coming into that and the junk luggers were the final ones and they were a dream. Uh, then you, now we're going to go to, okay, we did the piles, we did the maybes, take photos. Okay, so those are helpful for the CPAs, the financial planners, the trust and estates, you want to document everything. A very important piece of what we do is this inventory and their photos and their uh, values. And as we sort and organize, we are taking photos so that if, for example, Jessica's brother wants to see what's there, he's able to do it via this digital inventory. Also, as we decide what is going to be sold, what auction house decided to take what, what is going to be donated where, all of that is very, very clear in the inventory. Um, you know, this is a stressful time. We're here to kind of to help people. And when people are going through this during this time, their memory may be not so clear. So that uh, digital inventory is extremely useful for everybody involved. And um, then the final move, assuming that everything's going to be emptied out of this house, is of course to get the appropriate movers. We get the bids from the different movers. And then uh, we're very clear where, where everything is, who's getting what, is it going across the country, and where is it being donated. And of course, anything that we can recycle, shredding, all of that type of thing. Okay, so that's the top for this particular situation, but I do have a little bit of notes, Jackie, because you were talking about the value of the inventory for in divorcing situations. Thank you. Um, so the inventory is really, really valuable. Of course, when you're going through the, the divorce, you know, you're always talking about the financial assets, but the tangible assets, like you said, things can disappear, things can move, or you just forget about stuff. So I'm going to tell you a story, the chandelier story. So this was a family that we moved into a townhouse in New York, a beautiful townhouse, beautifully designed, gorgeous art lots of stuff and this one particular chandelier that was spectacular two hundred and fifty thousand dollars not a little item but obviously gorgeous and it sat uh on top of their dining room years and years go by and now this family the 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 couple is getting a divorce so the husband's moving out he's not interested uh you know the financial things that they have on paper is easy enough now they have to go through their physical assets he doesn't want the chandelier so what happened is uh, in the negotiations as they were doing that, she bought him out of this $250,000 chandelier. So he got 125,000 and she got to keep this gorgeous chandelier. A Couple of years after that, the lady decided she doesn't wanna stay in New York. She's going to sell the townhouse and all the assets. So now one of their assets, of course, the star of the story is the chandelier. And they were very disappointed to find out that they weren't getting respectable bids for this. I mean, it was so beautiful. So then what they had to do is, what they realized is they had never appraised it. So they went to appraise the stunning chandelier and it was worth $5,000. So you can imagine um, they have been paying insurance for this while it was in their home along with everything else. Then she had to pay the ex-husband, now ex-husband, $125,000 so that she can keep her portion. And, um, and it's worth $5,000. So what they had is the receipts, lots of receipts, but if you don't have an appraisal of some sort, then it's just what they paid. It's not what it was worth. So those are the, the documents when we're looking for things that are very important is the appraisers, uh, excuse me, the appraisals of art uh, and, and receipts to show provenance. 
So that's what I have to say. So, you know, too bad somebody wasn't there earlier on, an expert to sort of advise them with that. But that was a, a painful, painful lesson. Yeah, I mean, uh, Carolyn, I thought that was amazing. Uh, such an interesting look into how people deal with situations like that. I imagine you really play a very important role. I mean, you're really like in people's things, dealing with loss or transition. I mean, I think, you know, moving is one of the most stressful things in and of itself. So having to part with things you're not ready for and deal with siblings who might not be on the same page and estate planning and, and the shaking money out of books. That was like the one bright spot. That's great. Um, yeah, and I want to just reinforce, you know, the inventorying process is very, very important. Again, whether you are dealing with uh, an estate issue or a divorce, we should all have inventory of our nice things if we have insurance. Um, and at the same time, you know, what I see a lot in the divorce context, because no one really agrees with anything, is that a lot of times people are overvaluing their things, thinking it's so valuable when really, I hate to say it, judges just look at it like tag sale stuff. People will fight over the value of electronics and the bedroom set. And, and the judge will literally say at the end of the case, don't let me make the decision because I'm gonna order it to go to a tag sale. And right. people get pennies on the dollar. And right. so it's, it is true, you have to give these things away. It's not worth moving it in, you know, the moving expense is, is expensive. You know, moving is not a joke uh, to get insured movers. Uh, is costly. So it is important to have a mindset in life that things are going to, you know, these tangible things usually don't have a lot of value. You're really leaving a headache behind for your children to deal with. Why not empty out the closets and empty out the attic and give things away to your loved ones while they're alive or donate it. There are many, many places that will take used clothing and used books. And, and it really does feel great to just empty out closets. I don't know what it is, but uh, more no people question. should do it. It's, it's, it's something to do while we're all sort of stuck at home during this new resurgence during the pandemic. You know, empty out a closet, give some things away. There's always people. Uh, I feel like half of my Facebook feed is people that are giving things away or wanting things. And it really, it's just a good thing to do to lighten the load so that later on um, you're not dealing with potentially having to fight over it using appraisers. Exactly. Uh, in general, in my experience, unless we're talking about expensive art, which does come across in our cases or expensive cars or jewelry, we're not really looking at um, something worth fighting over later on. Another thing that I wanted to remark on, which is the number one question, guess what the number one question of Jessica's husband is going to be when he finds out that Jessica just got an inheritance? Any ideas, Aviva, Carolyn? How much? Right. So this is such a mis misperception that I'm going to clear out right now. I get this question all the time. If your spouse gets an inheritance, it's not marital property. You're not getting any of it. At Unless all. Not they co-mingle the right. assets. Right. So when Jessica's mom and dad died, and it could be multi-millions, it could be much less than that. But Jessica's husband is not entitled to any of that. Not the money shaking out of the books, not the bank accounts, not the cars, not the, not the house, none of it. Uh, it's Jessica's asset. Hopefully she'll be smart enough uh, to keep it in her own name. And her husband gets none of it. And it's never going to be on the table in a divorce case. Is it possible the court might consider it uh, in terms of spousal support or counsel fees? Uh, or possibly it'll be a factor, but it's not going to be shared with her husband. And so Jessica's husband, now you know. <laughs> that so that's, a all the time. that's a relief. Um, you know, what I was going to say, the good thing about inventory, as you were saying, is it, it's just a baseline. It's just sort of establishing what's there. And, you know, when when people are so contentious during that time, this way, it's just right in front of them. The lawyers don't want to deal with it. And, and it just, you know, it's transparent. It's uh, nonpartisan. It's just very clear, um, yeah. you know, what is there so that we can move, you know, yeah. Move them out, put them, you know, if the husband's going to take one thing or the, the wife somewhere else and just do it all seamlessly, right. seamlessly for them and for everybody else involved. So anyway, Absolutely. thank you. 
So uh, I do see your question, Judith. Judith has a question. I'm going to save it uh, for my presentation. So we're, we're at 12 o'clock. We're going to take a five minute break just so anyone can stretch their legs or maybe put in a question in the chat. I also want to uh, invite everyone to connect with me and Aviva and Carolyn on LinkedIn. I do a lot of posting there. Um, I put up a lot of information and usually events uh, that are coming up, I share it there. So please find us on LinkedIn. We're gonna take uh, a five minute or less break and then we're gonna resume with my presentation. We're gonna answer other questions that have come up. Uh, so please join us. And for now, uh, what I'm going to do is during the break is put up our slides again, just so you can catch up to where we are now. And I will see you all before 12.05.
Okay, um, we have a couple minutes, but I'm going to read out loud our hypothetical with Jessica. Give a little recap and we're going to get started. We do have some questions. Thank you for sending them in. We're going to answer all your questions. And as I mentioned before, because some of these questions you have might be confidential or sensitive, uh, you can easily contact me, Aviva or Carolyn. We're happy to answer your questions. Uh, we got some comments about people sharing uh, death of family members and dealing with things and it is overwhelming and, and getting help uh, definitely helps. It can make things um, feel less out of control and, and really is a financially can put you in a better position in many cases. So meet Jessica. Jessica is 55 years old. She's an empty nester in an unhappy marriage. There's no physical violence, but she feels like she is constantly being put down and marginalized. Her husband, Matthew, might be having an affair, but she's not even sure that she even cares. Jessica works full time and has a good income as a real estate broker, but she has credit card debt and very little in savings. Her father died five years ago and her mother recently passed away from COVID. Jessica has taken a leave of absence from work to deal with her mother's estate, house, and overflowing closets. Jeff Jessica's brother lives out of state and is no help. Okay, so, so now I'm going to uh, be responding to this hypothetical from a legal uh, perspective. And uh, a lot of it, as I mentioned, is really gonna touch on what we've already heard from um, our prior presenters. So, uh, again, by way of introduction, my name is Jackie Harunian. I'm a partner in Whistleman Harunian Family Law. And I wanna start out by saying that our, our, our law firm has an estate planning department and I have an estate planning partner. His name is Derek Rubin. And we are expanding that department. A lot of it is because of issues re regarding COVID. We have seen a lot more questions from our family law clients. First of all, they wanna do their wills because of health concerns or because of what's going on in their families, they wanna do financial planning and estate planning is part of that. Um, and family law really does encompass financial planning and estate planning. Uh, also the issue of prenups. We do a lot of prenups. Uh, I think many of you probably are aware that uh, marriages, getting married have sort of been put on hold. The US birth rate has dropped a lot during the pandemic. A lot of weddings have been postponed. And what's happening is that young people uh, are getting married later. And if they're getting married later, they're getting married with assets that they wanna protect. And prenuptial agreements are extremely popular right now. Um, couples are remarrying. A lot of times they don't wanna get married without a prenup with very good reason. And part of the reason why I talk about prenups um, and not that Jessica's getting remarried or needs a prenup, but prenups uh, and postnups, which are almost the same thing as a prenup, are a way to resolve financial issues and preserve relationships in many cases. Um, many times I will meet with parties that think they want a divorce, but in reality, there are financial issues that are of concern uh, that can be resolved in a financial agreement. And lo and behold, the marriage can be saved or they can go to a marriage counselor and deal with issues. Sometimes there are issues with children of a first marriage that cause uh, financial expense to a couple and the only way to resolve it is in a postnup or with some form of estate planning. So estate planning for most people um, is not costly. Doing a will, having a power of attorney, uh, living will, guardianship or trust is, is really not a big investment for most people, but it can pay dividends in terms of peace of mind and family mm -hmm. harmony. Um, and so I wanted to start by saying that, that estate planning is a very big part of the picture for family law. The other thing is we heard from Carolyn regarding tangible assets and stuff, uh, but there's now an area of estate planning that has to do with digital assets. And I think a lot of people have heard about Bitcoin or cryptocurrency or NFTs, which are uh, very specific types of assets that can be impossible to find. So most estate planning, most wills that we prepare include provisions to provide for digital assets, passwords to accounts, uh, passwords to, to Bitcoin wallets. It's very, very important that if you have these types of assets, that someone that you know and trust uh, is in a position 
to retrieve them in the event of your death or disability. Very important. If you lose a passport, a password to a cryptocurrency wallet, you could lose that asset. And this has been very widely reported in the news where people have not been able to access their own money because of the fact that passwords are not available. The same thing goes with Facebook accounts or um, other types of um, assets that might be online, online bank accounts. It is a very good idea to have all of those assets written down. This really goes back to what Aviva said about having a financial plan and doing a statement of net worth. Every single person, you don't have to be wealthy, should have their financial information written down um, and they should have that information available to people that they trust to access in the event of their death or disability. Very important. A lot of us might have parents that are starting to um, uh, become less capable of managing their own financial affairs. And so it's not an easy conversation to have, uh, but it's necessary to, to help monitor those accounts, to speak with siblings, make sure that there is a plan in place uh, so that assets are known and identified and can be retrieved uh, in the event it's necessary. And sometimes a power of attorney can help with that. So if you have any questions about anything like that, please contact me uh, or my partner, Derek Rubin. Um, we, are, we are really speaking to a lot of clients regarding um, estate planning and where it fits in with family law. So um, I am gonna be speaking a little bit about family law topics. Um, I think all of us can probably admit that during this pandemic, which is now in its third calendar year, even though it's you know, not, not really three years, but it, it is an ongoing thing that is causing stress to families, to individuals, to couples, to children. There is so much conflict on topics that we never even thought of before. Health concerns regarding children, masking, uh, their, their school attendance, uh, the children's mental health. These have become new battlegrounds, new points of conflict for parents. And my heart goes out to them. A lot of them really don't know how to deal with it. And so um, this is an issue that I know mental health professionals are aware of because there has never been such a strong demand for therapy. Uh, I think therapists are really very busy these days. I personally think almost everyone needs a therapist today. There's so much anxiety and uncertainty in our world. Uh, and, and, you know, the message of today's presentation really is simplifying life in many ways, being proactive in decision-making, clearing out stuff, um, and, and trying to live your best life. And this is something that we should all aspire to. What happens is a lot of times in families, especially during the pandemic, especially during quarantine, there has been a lot of anger. I see it a lot with women that are caring for their children. A lot of women have lost their jobs. They've had to stay home and care for their children because obviously someone needs to stay home if children have to learn remotely. And uh, a lot of times resentment and anger builds up because I don't think, uh, first of all, for a lot of couples, it's not exactly a second honeymoon to spend time together 24 seven. A lot of people are working from home. A lot of them don't have enough space to work from home. People have stopped going to the gym. They're working out from home. They're doing everything at home. And, and this has led to people upsizing their homes and relocating, uh, which has been good for the local housing market. But um, again, uh, it, it's, it's very, very important that if you want to avoid uh, having a family law situation, that you acknowledge uh, what's going on in the home, who's doing the heavy lifting when it comes to parenting, cleaning, uh, earning, spending. These, these conversations are very, very important. Um, so Jessica, let's talk about Jessica and what's going on with her. As I mentioned at the very beginning, it seems as if, uh, you know, Jessica is really not communicating that well with her spouse for good reason. She lost her father. She just lost her mother. She has a busy job. Um, and her spouse may be having an affair and he might not be having an affair. Um, and an affair is not necessarily the end of a marriage either. And that might sound controversial, but that is the truth. I deal with a lot of couples, especially older couples, and uh, sometimes um, an affair is not the end of the relationship. As I mentioned, there are trends in doing postnuptial agreements. Um, open marriage is a trend, living apart is a trend, and gray divorce is a trend. So gray divorce is divorces that occur for older couples. And that is uh, definitely on the rise. Divorces, separations, with older couples. 
Um, and that started happening about 10 years ago with no fault divorce. So now when people go through a divorce matter, they no longer have to allege grounds. They no longer have to prove grounds. So here I'm gonna put up my relationship tips and I'm going to go through them. And then we are going to answer questions relating any of the topics uh, discussed today. So I mentioned that um, infidelity might not be the end of a relationship. People have different um, you know, attitudes about it, different ways of coping with it. For some people, it's something that cannot be forgiven. And for others, especially in longer marriages, sometimes there is a way to get past it. What is never okay is domestic violence. Domestic violence, uh, and Jessica mentioned that uh, there's no physical violence in her relationship, but she feels like she's constantly being put down and marginalized. So I don't know if in that case that fits the definition of domestic violence. I would have to know much more about that. And if I were meeting with Jessica right now, um, I would wanna know about that. What does she mean when she says that she feels put down? Uh, is there financial control? Does her, is her husband putting her down and verbally abusing her to the point where she is losing herself and losing her dignity? Is she fearful of her husband? Is, she, is he threatening her? Um, is he humiliating her in public? None of that is okay. And, and all, all of that that I described, those last few words really do describe domestic abuse. Uh, and, and many people would say that verbal abuse and psychological torment and humiliation and financial control can actually leave more scars than a physical assault. It's just better hidden. And what I'm describing domestic violence, uh, which is never okay. I don't even know if it can be, uh, a therapist can fix it. Uh, there are ways to get help and intervention, including orders of protection, including calling the police. It does go back to setting boundaries and making sure that the people you live with know what is simply not tolerable. So if you're living in a situation where there are threats and there's abusive behavior, and um, it's something that you're feeling, you can't normalize it. You can't act like it's okay because usually that means it will get worse. So it does mean asking for help. Um, I, I do make referrals to the Safe Center. There are ways to get help from Shalom Task Force or UJA. Anyone who has questions about how to get help with domestic violence, we always offer a free consultation and I give a lot of referrals for that. There are ways to get help um, and to intervene so that you can feel safe in your own home. Domestic violence is a factor in custody determinations. Uh, even if uh, a person does not lay a hand on their own child, if the child is aware of the abuse, if has witnessed the abuse, that's considered a custody factor in the state of New York. And so it's important to document it. If you think that there's going to be um, a case coming up, if you feel your children are being affected, then first of all, you have an obligation to protect your children. Um, you can call Child Protective Services, or you can wait until one of your children speak to a friend at school or a teacher, and then the teacher is mandated to call Child Protective Services. Children are affected by abuse. If they see it, even if they're in another room, um, it's going to be something that's going to potentially be a factor in a custody case. So I don't mean to say uh, that abuse is only perpetrated on women, that only women are victims. That is not true. Women can be perpetrators of violence. They can be abusive. They can, verb they can verbally abuse their spouse and children. And in fact, I've had a number of cases during the pandemic where my women clients were the ones who were arrested, where there were orders of protection against both spouses because things are just getting out of hand at home. Um, and so um, that's number one. And I hope we're clear that there's no way to excuse it away. Um, in certain cultures and religious communities, there's a higher incidence of domestic violence, especially financial control. I've had a number of cases over the past year or two where my women clients literally didn't have enough money to go buy groceries, despite living in a multi-million dollar house. Uh, I've had situations where no assets are in the wife's name. All the assets are in uh, the husband's hands under his control and transferred to his family members. None of that is okay, that you're not gonna have a good relationship or a marriage that way. That doesn't mean 
that it's not marital property. Uh, there are ways to have that um, ruled on by a judge, but um, it, it's not the sign of a healthy relationship. And I encourage um, anyone who this might apply to, to do something about it. Um, number two is establish boundaries to avoid a buildup of resentment and anger. And these, these might be financial boundaries and they might be boundaries related to parenting. So I'll start with financial boundaries. There are many relationships. Uh, most people have two working parents in the home, but there might be one party who's spending more than the other. There might be one party that's saving more than the other. And um, this is a problem. It's going to cause resentment and anger in a relationship. Um, it, it can also be if you have a stay-at-home spouse and the other spouse is the only one earning. But all the spending is being done on one party. And sometimes it's not uh, affordable. I mean, you could have a couple like Jessica where there's a lot of credit card debt, even though there are high earners. And maybe in Jessica's situation, even though she's earning a lot, we don't really know what her husband does. But there's credit card debt. I mean, why is there credit card debt? Uh, maybe they need to meet with a financial counselor, um, maybe meet with a therapist, maybe create a budget, because uh, that type of toxic anger is going to potentially lead to a divorce. It could lead to health issues. It could eat, lead to stress. It could lead to foreclosure and bankruptcy and really um, outcomes that are very negative and impact the couple and their children. So you need to have appropriate spending. There needs to be money put in savings. Uh, there needs to be communication in order to avoid um, potentially a separation and divorce. And the law of New York is that if you have joint credit card debt, you're jointly responsible for the debt. Uh, if there are IRS debt and it's a joint tax return, you're both responsible. So there is no benefit to either party to stick their head in the stand and act like it's not happening. If there's debt, if the mortgage isn't being paid, um, you can't avoid the responsibility for it. Uh, it's going to affect your finances too. So ask questions, see if you can make changes, um, make good financial decisions. And that means meeting with advisors. Um, the debts that aren't really jointly uh, liable are student loans. So unless you put student loans of your spouse in your name, please don't ever do that. <laughs> student loans are not uh, jointly liable, but almost any other type of debt is going to be. So home equity lines, uh, credit card debts, you know, if you have a line of credit, uh, if you use it at a grocery store or use it at a yacht club, or you take out a line of credit for other things, this is going to be a joint marital obligation if you're still living together. Um, college loans are usually, you're both jointly liable. The proportion of the debt might be based on income. And if you have questions about that, these are not difficult to answer. The other thing that I mentioned to earlier that really builds up resentment and anger, really, and I can relate to it a little bit because I, my kids, I have four children, they all moved back home with my husband and I during the beginning part of the pandemic. Uh, there can be resentment and anger regarding who washes the dishes, who walks the dog, who's doing all the homework. Uh, you know, who is responsible for the schooling? I mean, remote schooling for young children and even older children is a huge issue. And parents really have been overwhelmed, as have teachers. As, you know, it's a no-win situation. It's really been extraordinarily difficult. But there has to be an atmosphere, whether you are living together, separated or divorced, where some of these responsibilities are shared. It's never great to have only one parent responsible for all of the child rearing, remote schooling, the homework, the projects, the bedtimes, the responsibilities, very easily can turn to a point of anger and resentment. And I meet with clients, men and women, that walk into my office or meet with me virtually, and they're like, I'm done. I've had it, I, I, I've, I've, we tried, we've tried counseling, it's too much, um, plus I'm paying all the bills, plus you know, he's sitting on the couch it's very easy to get to a tipping point where suddenly you can't go back to um, you know, a point where there's good communication. So communication about parenting is essential, whether you're married or divorced. And there are better outcomes for children if there's good communication, which is what number three is about. The better the communication is, the healthier the relationship. Uh, I mentioned money, in-laws, 
parenting, the bedroom, issues that are not addressed in the early stages almost always escalate and reach a point where it's almost un unresolvable. It's almost like hoarding, uh, Carolyn. You know, it's like you, you fill up one closet and then you don't address it. You fill up the next closet and then suddenly you have a house overflowing. You got to tackle those closets. Or, you know, to go back to Aviva's presentation, if there are debts and they're not addressed, you know, debts grow. There, there's interest on debts. There's late fees and penalties. Um, if you don't tackle problems when they're small, they're going to grow and magnify. And then eventually someone's going to call a divorce lawyer like me. So if you don't want that to be you, uh, make sure you have healthy communication. And, and again, this extends to co-parenting after divorce. Um, the best outcomes we see in divorce uh, for, for children are the ones where co-parents respect one another, where they, they can communicate about their children in a respectful way, even if it's by email. It's probably not a great idea to speak face-to-face -face, uh, or on the phone um, because sometimes it gets heated. But I always encourage my clients to find a respectful way to communicate and share information I love emails. I think every parent should do a weekly email. This is what I'm concerned about. You know, this is what's going on in our child's school. What do you think? You know, what is going on in your home? Is the, is, is the child, does the child mention bullying to you in your house or is he only mentioning it to me in my house? What should we do about it? Uh, you know, I always try to encourage my clients to remember that, you know, their child didn't ask to be born into a divorce matter. If there's conflict in the relationship, it's your obligation as a parent to do something about it. It's not your child's burden. So try to think of that. You, you created this child. You know, you chose this husband or this wife uh, to bring a child into the world. So try to make the experience less burdensome for your child. And a lot of that is done with respectful communication, making decisions collaboratively. Um, you know, trying to put money away and be financially responsible so that you can send your child to the same camp uh, or you can have some money set aside for your child's activities. And there is a way to co-parent. There is a way to actually have an amicable divorce and an aftermath of that where you're proud of your child and your child got an A on the report card and you're sending it to the other spouse and saying, look at our child, look what our child did. Isn't that wonderful? Or you're standing and watching the soccer game or the karate class, and you're both proud of your child, and you can share that pride together. I mean, these are habits that can start even at the start of a divorce. Practice makes perfect. You can actually say nice things about your ex, bite your tongue when it comes to your ex's new girlfriend, try to model good behavior, and uh, it's amazing what that can do to change the dynamic of a case suddenly the case is getting settled, suddenly things are being agreed upon. It really does start with you. And I'm really talking about 80% of the cases where I think these, this type of outcome is possible. 80% of cases where uh, you know, mediation or resolving issues in a friendly way is within reach, especially if you have a lawyer that encourages that. For some cases, 10 to 20% of cases, that's not in the cards. You can be the best communicator. You can be the fairest, most reasonable person. And your ex is just not on board. So uh, I still say take the high road in those situations um, and hope that your ex will follow suit. And if he doesn't or she doesn't, at least you have a child that's growing up part of the time in a household where there is an anger, where there is a reasonable approach. Um, and, and I have seen uh, sometimes six months out, a year out, two years out, things get better. It does take someone, hopefully both of you, trying to set a more positive outlook. Um, and, and the benefits to the children are extraordinary. I mean, they, they are, they're not in therapy all the time. They're not angry. They're doing better in school. Um, not easy, but with good coaching, and I, there's a lot of good divorce coaches out there, co-parenting coaches, use technology, a lot of ways to upgrade your communication. If you're in a marriage that's not doing great, or in a divorce and you wanna learn how to get it right so you're not in family court every year. All right, so number four, get assets titled in your name. Very, very important. 
whether you are married or divorced. Uh, if you're married or if you're living together with someone and not getting married, which is a huge trend right now, a lot of young people in their 20s, 30s are not planning to get married. They're going to live together. But it's very risky not to have your name on an asset. So, for example, yesterday I got a call from a very lovely woman who raised three children with someone. They never got married. He bought a house with her down payment money that she cashed in from her IRA and the house was in his name and she didn't think anything of it because this was over 20 years ago and she raised her children with this man and guess what they're breaking up and now suddenly he's changed the locks on the house because she went to visit her mother in Florida who had COVID and uh, she has a big problem now uh, this is really a real estate problem uh, it's not really a family law matter because they were never married it's, it's a real estate partnership issue and there are ways to deal with it legally. And we handle those matters all the time in our office because it's a very common situation. But uh, imagine how amazing it would have been if her name was on the deed already. Imagine if she had had it in writing that she cashed in her IRA and paid the down payment and, and was a nurse and helped pay the mortgage all these years, how much easier a problem it would be to resolve. I did, I did put her mind at ease. I did tell her, don't worry too much. Get your finances in order. Let's prove that you helped buy this house. And if necessary, we can get a restraining order. And I mean, she was crying with relief at the end of our conversation yesterday. Um, but it really does prove the point of how important it is for women, especially get assets in your name. And one of my favorite, favorite quotes from Joan Rivers, and I quote her often, one of her best quotes was, love your husband, adore your husband, but get assets in your name. Something like that. That's what the quote is like. And it's true. This is, this is just a rule of thumb if you're married. If your assets are not in your name, if your house is not in your name, uh, it, it kind of begs the question, why not? Why not? Um, I, I have a lot of situations where the mortgage is in the wife's name, but the house is still in the husband's name. Why? That shouldn't have happened. You know, there are very, very few good reasons for that. So maybe there's a reason, but you should know what it is. And these are the types of things that also build up resentment in marriage, where a perfectly good marriage is, is really ruined because the wife feels so upset that she doesn't have anything in her name. There's no life insurance to protect her. She's raising children or doing her best to be a loving spouse. And you have a spouse who's just very controlling. And it's going to be his way or it's going to be her way and you know these types of controlling behaviors uh, don't lead to necessarily the best outcomes so listen and and try to learn what's aggravating your spouse and and if you're in a position to do something about it uh this is something also we can help with we do plenty of real estate matters here number five watch out for debts and order your credit report annually so i mentioned this before um you know, anyone can go on freecreditreport.com and get one credit report for free every year. Uh, so I think everyone should add that to the list of what they should do is order your credit report, find out what's going on with your credit score. Uh, it's important to have a decent credit score. It affects you in many ways in life. Uh, know what your debts are. You're going to find those on your credit report. There might be debts you didn't know about. Uh, all kinds of uh, situations or heights where people come to me and they will find out there's gambling debt of 50,000. There's credit card debt that they didn't even know about in their own name using their own social security number. Um, there really is no excuse not to find out what your financial scenario is when it's so easy to find out. So freecreditreport.com, please uh, make sure you get a copy of your credit report and ask questions. Uh, open the mail if it comes in. Uh, you know, check out what's going on with those online accounts and credit cards. You should also go to ssa.gov. I should have put it on the list. ssa.gov is where you find out how much you're going to get in Social Security benefits when you retire. Uh, and it actually will tell you what you get if you're divorced and what happens if you're widowed and what happens if you stay married. Uh, it's useful information to have. It's part of financial planning. And sometimes people are pleasantly surprised that the number is higher than they thought it would be. Uh, and one more website that you should check out is irs.gov. irs.gov is the US government website for the Eternal Revenue Service. It's where you can get copies of your own tax returns. 
So they're free. It takes some time to get it, but go on there, ask for copies, and you'll have the answers you need. And going back to the theme of our presentation today, it might feel overwhelming uh, to look at a tax return. I mean, it looks like another language if you don't know what it is, but it's the first step. Get copies of the returns, um, see what's on there. And it doesn't cost a lot of money to meet with your own accountant and ask questions. As Aviva said, there are no dumb questions. Financial advisors answer these questions all the time. They know tax returns like the back of their hand. They will put your mind at ease. And, and peace of mind is a great thing. And knowledge is power. Uh, this is number six. Look at your tax return, ask questions. No excuse not to. You can get the copy from irs.gov. If you're married or divorced or widowed, you need to know what's on your tax return because uh, in divorce court, if you end up divorced, the judge is gonna hold you responsible for what's on the tax return, whether you knew what was on there or not. The judge doesn't care, especially if it's a woman judge. She looks at her tax returns. She expects you to look at your tax returns. You need to know what's on there. And you can't just say, I didn't know because everyone knows you can get copies of your tax return from your accountant or from irs.gov. So you gotta get a copy. You've gotta find out what's on there. Um, if you're in a marriage where you're not reporting money because it's cash, well, you're gonna get busted if you go through divorce. That's an issue. And you might wanna speak to an accountant about how to address that issue and protect yourself. Um, because lots of marriages have unreported income or taxes that aren't paid. And like I said, those could eventually affect your assets at least once a year. Uh, it's always a woman that's a little bit older and who's somewhat affluent, or at least thought she was affluent, and will come in to me and tell me that there's tax liens everywhere and she's about to lose her house and move in with her mother because there's nothing left. So that does happen. Sometimes it happens in marriages where the husband doesn't want to tell the wife what's going on because he wants to protect her or he's ashamed and there'll be financial secrets and he loves her and but it's too late and there are other marriages where the husband is just up to no good and she's the last to know so these are things that you will find out in your credit report right away so that's another reason why you want to look at your credit report because that's where the information is and it's easily obtainable so now i'm going to stop this share and we have questions that we're now going to answer and um, let me see who these questions are for. And Aviva and Carolyn, please feel free to chime in so we can answer these questions together. But the first one is from Judith and it says, I have a patient whose husband bought an apartment in his name post-marriage in his name only with all expenses paid by him. Is this apartment considered to be marital property? So that's actually a pretty straightforward question. Uh, and the answer is, if it was bought during the marriage, it is marital property, flat out. It's on the table. Now, does it mean that she gets half? No, it doesn't, because it really depends how it was purchased. So if the husband bought the apartment post-marriage in his name with all expenses paid by him, if it means he paid for the entire apartment in cash, um, and that's how the apartment was purchased, then that means that cash down payment or cash purchase is definitely a separate property credit to him. Now, if he got a mortgage and put a down payment, then maybe only the down payment belongs to him. But Jack, if, he put, if he paid cash and it was for marital assets that he paid yes. it in cash, yes. then it's also marital. Very good point. Where the money came from, is really the crucial question. Now, if he got a mortgage, even if the down payment was his from prior to the marriage, if he got a mortgage and they're a married couple and he's paying down the mortgage and paying taxes and fixing up the bathroom, all of that is marital property. The growth in value is marital property. So Judith, I hope that answers your question. Uh, unless there's a prenup, there's good news here for your patient because uh, there's probably some claim that she has to this apartment. This is, I'm glad that you're on top of this. Hopefully she is too. There's no reason why her name is not on that apartment unless uh, really it's money that he owned before the marriage. And even then she potentially is going to gain from it. 
If it's a second marriage, maybe he bought this with his own money from before the marriage and wants to leave it to his children. Like I said, there's a lot of estate planning components, especially in second marriages, especially for older couples. Uh, you know, she might be perfectly okay with his explanation, but she should know the answer. And in any event, as a married couple, if they live together and the apartment grows in value, someone's paying the taxes, they're using marital income probably to pay the taxes, uh, even if she's staying home and not working, she has a claim. I hope that answers your question. If you have a follow-up question, Judith, just put it in the chat or ask again. So we have another question. Anonymous attendee asks, if a parent left you money and you put it in your account, does it have to be listed as assets anyway if it's not your spouse's? Very good question. So if you're talking about listing assets in a financial affidavit, that financial affidavit is under oath. So yes, you have to disclose everything in your name. However, if that money came from your parents and it went right into your account in your name, you have literally nothing to worry about. It's, it's not gonna be shared as marital property. It's always better to disclose truthfully and accurately and thoroughly when you're doing a financial affidavit, especially if it's gonna to go to a judge. One of the biggest mistakes people make is they leave out assets or they forget or their lawyer doesn't do a great job and then it comes up later on in the case and it is does affect your credibility. You don't wanna be in a situation where you're accused of failing to disclose assets. There's no benefit. Um, you know, cases settle more quickly when information is up to date and accurate on a financial affidavit. And uh, what is a financial affidavit? It has four components. It's your income, it's your assets, it's your debts and your expenses. Those are the four main categories. It's what you have, what you owe, what you spend, and what you save. Everyone should know, you know, not down to the penny, but you should have some sense as a, as a person, you know, walking around on this earth, what the answer is to those things. And any good financial advisor can help you improve in those areas. And uh, certainly, you know, as you start to get older and your children get older, you wanna have that information written down somewhere or on a computer file somewhere so that you can organize the information for the benefit of your family if it's necessary. Uh, Aviva or Carolyn, do you have any follow-up? And then we have another couple of questions. Anything to add? No, I think you did a very great job. Thank you. Okay. So someone is asking, when I inherit money, should it be kept Separate from my husband, I'm not contemplating divorce, married a very long time. Uh, my answer to that is always yes, it should be kept separate. Um, if you want to use the money to help buy a house or buy a vacation home, very simple to put it in writing. Honey, I love you. I'm going to buy a house. We're going to go together to this vacation home. But in the event of my death or divorce, we all know it's mine. Let's just put that in writing. There are ways to spend your inheritance in ways that are beneficial to a marriage. But just know that if you use it to pay off a debt or if you use it to lease a car or buy a car for your spouse, you're effectively gifting it to your spouse. So listen, you can't take your money with you. Obviously, if you're in a good relationship, you want to potentially share it with your spouse, buy him a nice gift, go on a nice vacation. These are what money is for. But uh, I would caution you against putting your spouse's name on an account or, um, you know, being generous to the point where later on you might have regret. This is what postnuptial agreements and prenuptial agreements are all about. They really work. They keep people out of court. They restore marital harmony. Um, they set expectations and, and everyone knows, you know, what each other has. These are always very good things um, to have all of that written down. Um, Okay, we're getting towards the end here. Let me see. I have uh, one more question here from Julie. If inheritance was deposited in joint account, does it become marital property? Yes. So yeah, the answer is yes, it does. This is a very good question. I can see there's a lot of questions related to estate planning and inheritance. And it's a, it's a good thing to know the answer. So I wanna reiterate the legal rules. Number one, in New York State, inheritance is always yours. It's always separate property and you need to protect it by keeping it in your own name. If you make it a joint account or buy a house 
and uh, it use your monies from your inheritance to buy a house and the house is in bo both names, you have commingled that money. Now in New York, there is a way with an attorney or before a judge to get back your down payment or make what's called a separate property claim. Because if you can prove the money really came and you can show where the checks came from and where it went, you will have a claim for separate property. But it can be messy, doesn't always work out perfectly, far better to have it in writing in advance. And it, it's very easy to do that, not costly at all to do an agreement like that. We have situations where people will inherit money, put it in a bank account, uh, put the husband's name on it, and then spend the money. And then later on, they come to court and say, judge, I want that money back. That never works. That won't work. A court, a divorce court is not going to go back and do a forensic audit on how you spent your money during your marriage. You're a married couple. You made decisions together regarding money. You spent it. You saved it. You titled assets. And so you're kind of stuck with the outcome if that money is already gone. In a house situation, it's different. In a house, the court almost views it like it was a lender who lent the money. And so that money goes back. Uh, with a bank account that's already spent, um, no such luck at all. Okay, a couple more questions here. Helene is asking, um, I have a patient who has been living with his girlfriend for four years. They bought a house together last year and now they're breaking up. So this is very similar to the, the case I mentioned from the woman I met yesterday, except he's on the deed with her and she paid the payment. He's paid the mortgage most months and invested. Uh, with renovations. Now he's rented an apartment and she's living in the house with the intention of selling it in the spring. How much is he entitled to when the house sells? Uh, this is a little tricky, um, but ultimately because the house is in both names, they are both owners of the home. And it would be treated as if it was a real estate investment with two partners on the name of a real estate. They both are gonna have to demonstrate what contributions they made to purchase the house to improve the house, and then what went on with paying the mortgage and taxes. It really is arithmetic. It really comes down to, do you have the records? Can you prove what was paid? And, and just get an Excel spreadsheet and itemize all of the contributions. The growth in value of that um, house is, is gonna be shared the way it would be with any investor, unless they had something written down regarding it. So he's rented an apartment and she's living in the house um, so he's moved out, in other words, and she's in the house. So uh, in a way, he's given up the house as a residence. When you move out of a house, even if you own it, you can't necessarily move back in. Uh, but maybe he did that because he didn't want to live with her together. And I, I'm, I'm guessing they don't have children together. Uh, so she's in the house. Hopefully she's going to be good on her word and sell it in the spring. The housing market's pretty good. So maybe they're both going to come out okay. For sure, before they get to closing, they need to really have a, a concrete understanding on where that money goes at closing. And, and they're both gonna make money because the housing market's good. So hopefully it goes well. Uh, last question. It's a Bitcoin question. Anonymous attendee asks, how hard is it to find money through Bitcoin that has been hidden through a divorce? So we get a lot of Bitcoin questions these days because a lot of people are investing in cryptocurrency and NFTs, which is those, those digital art. Um, if you don't know what it is, Google it and you'll find out it's very interesting. But digital assets like Bitcoin <coughs> are very easy to hide. That's the whole point of it. It's, it's easy to hide. And um, it, it really is the domain of certain investors that are very attracted to novelty and risk and secrecy and uh, you know maybe even money laundering. I don't know. but um, it does have to be disclosed in a divorce. And if you have a sense that there's Bitcoin investments as a spouse, hopefully you have some proof of that. You've seen an email, you've seen um, financial activity, uh, your spouse talks about it, hopefully you can get it on tape. Um, you wanna have there are, proof. There are forensic accountants that are now specializing in finding Bitcoin assets. So if, if that is a situation, contact us. We can put you in touch with somebody who can uh, help you find those. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you can um, 
get a restraining order on the hard drive of a computer. Um, you can uh, subpoena financial records. There is, uh, I think, some legislation proposed that's going to require cryptocurrency activity to be reported to the IRS. So I think we're hopefully heading to a point where it can be tracked uh, more efficiently. But, uh, you know, whether it's cryptocurrency or wire transfers to family in India or cash or jewelry, uh, if these things are being purchased um, or acquired, you need to find a way to trace it. We have clients that will come to us and will notice that their spouse went to the ATM every day for years and socked away tens of thousands in cash. Um, very common. Or wire transfers out of the country or purchase of Bitcoin because you can find it on, on the, on the um, you know, it comes from the tax returns the paycheck or the income going into a bank account, and then tracing where the money goes after that. As Aviva mentioned, there are forensic evaluators in divorce and accountants that do exactly that. They find the money, they track the money, and so you have a chance of potentially recouping it. But if you, if you really are not paying attention, if your spouse did it, uh, maybe using cash in someone else's name in another account, Bitcoin is tricky and it's a problem. And the only antidote to that is really keeping your eyes open and, and really keeping track of the money in your household and where it goes. So it's a tall order in some families, but it's it's a trend in the future. I mean, Bitcoin is becoming more and more popular and uh, E-Trade accounts and other types of online accounts. And, um, you know, it might be surprising to learn that people lie in divorce. There's a lot of, you know, people that don't tell the truth. They have a financial motive, they're angry and they wanna win. And win sometimes means keeping more money than they disclose. And so we have to be very, very careful. Um, and judges don't believe anybody. They don't necessarily believe either side. Um, credibility is extremely important in family law matters. And this is why judges like to appoint experts and have smart people like Carolyn and, and Aviva involved, uh, especially if they're neutral, because um, neutral information is what courts find reliable. And it's expensive. You know, having experts and neutral experts in a case for sure means you're in court. It means that the case is gonna be more costly. And so prevention is better than the cure. So uh, the way to have a less costly situation with more peace of mind is to sort of follow the money while you're still in the relationship and have access uh, to the information. I'm going to give the last word um, to Carolyn and Aviva. We'll start with Carolyn. Is there any parting words you have for us? I, I want to first say thank you very much for being part of such a great presentation. We've gotten some wonderful comments um, in the chat, and I, I really learned a lot um, from you, Carolyn. You go first, and then Aviva. I just wanted to say, oh, yes, I'm one. I just wanted to say thank you so much, first of all, for including me. I mean, I'm just, you know, fascinated by every detail. I am a, a, di a divorced lady, but luckily not a very contentious one, but it, it uh, you know, it wasn't a contentious one. So, you know, it's so informative and great to know how you have everything covered. And Aviva, yeah, that was really helpful, all that information. And uh, no, this was just really wonderful. Thank you so much for including me. I appreciate it. My pleasure. I'm going to put our contact information up on the screen as we say goodbye. Um, but then Aviva, we're up to you. Can you tell us anything as a, as a goodbye? Yes, goodbye so thoughts? I think the most important thing is it's a new year. Get yourself organized. If you need help, reach out. We can help you do it. But the most important thing is just get yourself together. It'll make the it'll make a world of difference. And uh, I wish everybody a happy new year. And Jackie, thank you for having us. Carolyn, it was a pleasure being part of this with you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Take care, everyone. Ending now. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Gina. Thanks, Natasha. Thanks for all the great feedback, everyone.